Hi there. Welcome to Charles in Charge. I'm Nicola Charles. And today I have two very distinguished guests. And this was going to be a podcast, but then Victoria was launched into another sort of mini lockdown for five days. And that's one of the things we'll be discussing today. Um, but I am very, very lucky to have two extremely experienced gentlemen with me, one from the world of politics and one from the world of policing. So I've already got my British guilt intact. I haven't done anything wrong, but I feel guilty already. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about all things politics really. And the reason this interests me so much is that I recently moved a few years ago back to Australia from California. And California has a system which is actually being implemented right now where you can vote to recall the governor, which is essentially the same thing as the Premier of Victoria, uh, Mr. Dan Andrews. And his name is Gavin Newsom in California. And in order for that recall vote to count, in order for the recall to happen, they had to get 1.5 million signatures, which is an awful lot, um, so soon after a big election in America. And they have actually achieved that. And there's much consternation now about the legitimacy of those signatures, which of course they didn't worry about in the election, um, but they are now with the recall. Unfortunately, the way the constitution in Victoria is set up is that we probably at the moment can't do that despite quite a lot of people wanting to because Mr. Dan Andrews has a lot of supporters on one side, but he is also growing a lot of people who are moving against him on the other. So today, my two guests are very, very interesting customers because they're experienced in this and they're going to speak to these issues. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Steve MacArthur, and I'll allow Steve to explain who he is in a minute, and also the former Police Commissioner of Victoria, Cal Blair, and I know a lot of you are really excited to hear him speak as well. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Steve. Steve, tell us a bit about yourself, particularly for those in the rest of the world who don't know who you are. Well, thanks very much, Nicola, and good evening to you, and uh, good evening, Kel. Uh, Nicola, I'm a, a former state member. Uh, I was the member for Monbulk from 1992 to 2002, um, but I'm what you call probably an, an accidental politician. It, it was never my life choice. Uh, I was busily occupied in a family business in a career of, uh, on the land and um, got into an argument with Joan Kerner over land use in the mid 80s, loved the battle, lost the war and ended up in politics mm. uh, and learned a lot, uh, really enjoyed the experience, learned a lot. Uh, I was part of the Kennett government uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and I think it's reasonably well recognised and accepted now uh, that Jeff Kennett and his government turned Victoria from a rust bucket state into a thriving, uh, booming economy, a place that people wanted to move to and wanted to work in and wanted to be part of. Uh, and sadly, I think the next government of Victoria will face problems similar to what Jeff Kennett faced in, in 1992. Yeah, actually, I came to Australia to Victoria in the 90s and I loved it and it was definitely a boom time. And we also have Cal Blair with a very lofty title of former police commissioner of Victoria. Cal, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I was a member of the Victoria Police Force for over 35 years, started as a constable, ended up in a variety of roles on the way, ended up for the last five years of my career from 1987 to 1992 as the Chief Commissioner. I left school at 14, having a failed year 10. Went back 17 years later, uh, got a place to do law at the University of Melbourne, uh, obtained an honours degree there, and was admitted to practice as a barrister and solicitor. I guess uh, that about uh, sums me up. Well, that's a, that's a lot. Should, that's I, a big achievement. I should, say, uh, I should say six years ago with one other, uh, I formed the Community Advocacy Alliance and we're a think tank come lobby group. Uh, and what we're about is honest and accountable and ethical government, as well as a police force that serves the needs of the community and a criminal justice system that uh, is fair and gives victims a say in the process. 
I also have a vital interest in post-traumatic stress disorder and the way that affects emergency service workers, particularly police. So that's why we formed this organisation and we've been very active over the last six years. Wow, ethical government would be amazing, wouldn't it? Anywhere in the world right now, to be honest. So Steve, tell us a bit about what you explained to me the other day when we met for coffee, because it's really fascinating because we can't actually recall Dan Andrews, can we? No, we can't, Nicola. Uh, and the Victorian constitution, I'll, I'll go back a step, uh, if I may, before I get into this. Uh, Kel, as he said, founded CAA uh, and Recently, it's sort of broadened its focus a little bit, uh, a bit broader than the, the law and order and policing issues, and, and is looking much more at good government and good governance. Uh, and uh, for my sins, he, he's asked me to chair the, uh, the legislative team in CAA. We've been examining the issue of direct democracy for, the last, for several months now. Uh, and about 20 years ago, the Victorian constitution was changed. Uh, essentially, people were persuaded to uh, and like the change because they were told that it was about providing fixed four year terms of government. And it has done that. Uh, there are no early elections anymore. We know when the election will be. It's on the last Saturday in November every four years. The next one is in, in 2022. And I can tell you when the one is, it's scheduled in 2026 and in 2030. Now, that predictability was popular at the start. Um, it has some inherent flaws. It also made the position of Premier absolutely impregnable. There is no way under any sort of crisis at the moment for uh, an election to occur. So Dan One Andrews two, is bulletproof. That's what you're saying. It doesn't matter what he does. He's essentially bulletproof, right? Yeah. There are two ways of triggering an early election in the Constitution, and both are in control of the Premier. And he's not going to do it unless it's to his political advantage. Mm. Uh, so you get the situation now where he's got, he, he, well, any Premier uh, could do this, but we've seen an enormous erosion of civil liberties. We've seen uh, abolition of democratic rights. A lot of freedoms that Australians have taken for granted for generations have simply disappeared in the last several months. And, and I think that's a major problem and a major worry for our future. Yeah. I mean, from what I've seen personally, and I'm kind of plugged into a lot of groups, I did an interview last night with End the Lockdown Australia, and um, just reading through some of those pages, the sea change for Dan Andrews has been huge, and just a lot of decisions that he's been making politically, which probably wouldn't have been talked about otherwise, are now sort of coming to the surface because of the decisions he's been making with regard to the tennis, um, the Chinese New Year, the Australia Day marches. Um, and I have to say, I'm just feeling very, very nervous about him being in control of our futures because it's, it's quite confusing for me as a Brit because... I'm not sure it works like this in the UK. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. As far as I was concerned, and I was on radio last year and I was quite happy that, you know, ScoMo was in. And um, now we find that he's not really making decisions for Victoria. It's Dan Andrews, who's from a completely different political party. And he seems to be running it like his own private island. And I'm just very confused as to how much freedom he's been given to do that. Yeah, well, I'm not interested in politics per se, but I, as, as I said, I'm very interested in honest, accountable, ethical government. That's not what we're having in Victoria. If we look back at a number of instances, there was the red shirts brought, uh, cooperation promised, not delivered. There was $1.2 billion wasted on not building a road, said there'll be no compensation paid. It was $1.2 billion. And uh, there's been a litany of other things that call the um, ethics of this government into account. Now, we should be operating out of the Westminster system. The Premier, as Premier, should be taking a responsibility and accountable for all, and being accountable for all of these things. Yeah. He's simply doing so. He is not being accountable. And when uh, you have an inquiry that's uh, set up, the Premier decides who the commission is going to be for that inquiry. Hmm. He then decides who council assisting will be. He then has council assisting, uh, instructed by the Victorian Government Solicitor's Office. And one can see there's a pattern developing here that uh, this uh, commission to, to look into uh, 
all these matters was doomed to failure. You know, when you appoint the umpire, when you appoint the players, and when you decide the result in advance, it can't be said that there's any independence or that there's ethical standards being applied. It's just not happening. And it sounds not- like a dictatorship, Cal, to me. That's what it sounds like. I mean, normally with politicians, and I focus a lot on American politics, is that you know, if you if you had to think about sort of negatives and broken promises and bad decisions, you'd have to think to drum up three or four. But with Dan Andrews, there are so many like, you know, learning last week that he'd spent seven million dollars of taxpayers money on his own legal defense. So he didn't have to explain the hotel quarantine fiasco. I mean, that's just crazy to me that he's and and it started for me last year on radio because our station at the time, it's in South Bank now, but in the time it was in Richmond and he was opening these safe injecting rooms next to kindergartens. And so people were already starting to say, what's going on with this guy? We're not 100 percent sure about the decisions he's making. And it seems to have gone from bad to worse. I mean, I know personally for me, I lost my radio career because of the 111 day lockdown and the pandemic. And I'm not looking to blame anyone for that, but I know so many people who suffered with their careers and it's just a bit, the whole follow the science thing that he does is just a bit confusing for me because you've got Bill Gates on one hand saying that everyone needs this PPE when they're working with COVID patients and they're covered from head to toe and they look like spacemen. And then for us, they hold up a little surgical mask and go, oh yeah, if you go out in that, you'll be fine. So it's very, very confusing. I don't find his communication skills very good. I think he sees things like all politicians through a political lens. And when he's up there on the podium, all I see is a guy trying to cover his own ass and not looking out for the people he's meant to represent. So Steve, please tell Tell me what can be done. What are the steps? What are the little steps we can do? Because we know we can't affect anything until the next guy, right? Yes. Uh, Nicola, you mentioned the word dictatorship, and, and I think it's, it's an appropriate uh, term here. Not all dictators seize power by force. Some are elected, uh, some are appointed, uh, and, and then overstep the mark. And a couple of examples in recent world history in Venezuela, they elected Hugo Chavez and uh, Nicolas Maduro, um, popularly elected, but people who turned into despotic dictators in very short term and, and the people, of, you know, the, the broader people in Venezuela have suffered massively as a result. Massively. Dan Andrews has iron control over the Labor Party at the moment. The Labor Party has a strong majority in the lower house and the upper house in the Victorian Parliament is now, uh, thanks to the changes of the constitution back in 2003, is now a toothless tiger. So he has an impregnable position. And unless the constitution is changed to allow for recall uh, and a recall petition, that that will continue on. And we may, at some stage in the future, get a more dictatorial friend yeah. elected, uh, even than Dan Andrews. Uh, what a great job. Who has a job where there's no checks and balances? Who on earth has that job? None of us do. Well, God's got it for those who believe in God, but that's about the only one. Yeah. Uh, nobody in politics has, uh, well, uh, sorry, that's not quite true. In, in communist China, Xi Jinping has been elected leader yeah. for life. And uh, Kim Jong-un is, I think, the leader in, <laughs> for life as well. But yeah. they're the only examples. In democratic countries, no one should have- Supposedly. In a protected electric, elected position. You should always be accountable to the people. You are elected to serve the people you must be accountable to the people. So who checks Dan? Way... Can ScoMo check Dan? Can anyone check Dan? No. That's the sad thing. No one can check Dan. Uh, under the national constitution, the state's constitution, he is impregnable. And That's unless... like a king. That can't be true. That's like a king. That That's crazy. How did that happen in Australia? Why did this happen in 2003? Who started that? Steve Brax is the man or the gut, led the government that brought these changes in. And at the time, they were welcomed. And as I said, they were explained on the basis of a fixed four-year term of government. But it restricted the powers of the governor. It mm. restricted the powers of the upper house. And it only allowed two ways of achieving an early election. And both of those are in the hands of the premier. So they are not going to happen unless it's in his political, uh, to his political advantage. The only way to break this, the only way to provide a safety valve, a, a circuit breaker, yeah. is to do what many other countries have done and states have done around the world, and that's to provide 
for a, a, a recall petition and uh, a re which would trigger a recall election. Now, it happens in Asia, it happens in Europe, it happens in the Americas, and it has worked quite well in most of those places. The, the model that we at CAA are looking at is the one that operates in Bavaria, uh, a st mm. state of Germany. Bavaria has about 13 million people. They can have a recall election if a million voters sign a petition to trigger it. It's never happened, uh, but they've had a couple of petitions started which caused the resignation of the government of the day. Mm. Uh, how and many million we'll, people do you think would sign to recall Dan Andrews? Well, the story is about <laughs> six and a half million people. Right. So a similar a, a similar threshold would be half a million voters to sign, and it has to be it has to be enrolled voters. Um, so half a million, and that's a ta that's a massive task. And if somebody yeah. or some organisation started a petition that attracted half a million signatures, that is a clear signal that the public that the voters are very, very angry with the government of the day. And it should trigger an election. It provides that safety valve, that circuit breaker, uh, to stop a despot or a corrupt government. Yeah. From doing what Who was it do that used to have that poster in the, in the 90s? I used to be driving down the freeways in Victoria and there was a poster and it said something like, keep the bastards honest. Who was that? <laughs> Don Chip. And he actually <laughs> lived in the hills. He lived not far from where you are, Nicola. He lived. Uh, Don't tell them where I live, Steve. <laughs> well, you live in the hills. I think that's well known. Everyone knows I live in the hills. Yeah. He lived in Keeley Lane, up at Calista. Right. Uh, and Don started the Democrats with the slogan "Keep the bastards honest." And initially, that's exactly what the Democrats did. Uh, yeah. They changed after he uh, he left the leadership, but. They started off as a, an honest broker somewhere in the middle between the Labor Party and the, and the coalition. And that worked quite well at the time. Uh, we, know, we don't have that anymore at federal level and we certainly don't have it at state level. Steve, why do politicians change? Are they corrupt? Why do they change? Do they get power crazed? Do they get no, comfortable? What is it? They always seem to change. They always make so many promises. And then when they get there, it's like, oh, well, we, are, we didn't mean it 100%. You know, it's like Joe Biden now. I'll get schools back within the first 100 days. And they're going back one day a week. And he's like, well, I didn't say they'd be back five days a week. And it's just, why do they do this, Steve? They're driving us insane. These people that run our lives, these elites, these political elites, you could put in a room from each country. They, they go in a large room. But we are millions and billions of people and we're all sitting here globally open-mouthed at the decisions these people are making. And it's our lives. We're suffering. Surely there's something we can do. They are corrupts, absolutely. They are corrupts, absolutely. And this is what we're seeing. Uh, it's an exercise of power. We have just the current uh, lockdown has just finished. Uh, Melbourne has a couple of cases of coronavirus and uh, we've got the people of Mildura running around lockdown, uh, not running around, lockdown, wearing masks outside and inside. They're 700 kilometres or thereabouts from Melbourne. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. Yeah. And the coronavirus is very dangerous, there's no doubt about that, because it destroys the memory of people who haven't even had it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Idiocy is the real virus. <laughs> When, when you look at uh, you know, the current inquiry again, where no one could decide who made the decision to employ private security. Now, yeah. if you believe that, you could come and, come and see the fairies at the bottom of my garden. <laughs> I mean, it's just absolutely absurd. Uh, it, it is beyond any form of credibility, and yet there is absolutely nothing at the moment we can do about it. So and they, we, they deliver uh, this rubbish with such a straight face, Cal, don't they? Well... I, mean, I just deplore what's happening because uh, there's no standards, there's no ethics, there's no morals. Uh, Victoria has been responsible for 90% of the deaths from COVID um, in the country and no one is accountable for it. Yeah. And one of the fears I'm sure is that if they become accountable for it, uh, this government would be subject to its own laws about industrial manslaughter. 
Right. Interesting. So I was right because I always get that feeling that they are. And I know that we all have to do this in jobs. Look, I've, I've worked for big corporations and some of the best advice I've been given is always cover your ass. Like when you make a decision, make sure you've covered your own ass when you make that decision. But it always just feels when they're up there on the podium that, OK, I realize they see through a political lens. But as we're saying, Dan Andrews can't be kicked out. He's essentially the king of Victoria until 2022. So why is he up there covering his ass? Is it OK, so we can't do a recall, but can we investigate him? Can we do anything like that? Well, the opportunity, I suppose, in relation to the government uh, was in relation to the so-called red shirts rules where the minions on the ground were arrested and brought in for interrogation by police and the politicians refused to attend and were allowed to get away with it. Now, I would have been knocking on their doors at six o'clock in the morning and they'd have been in a police station answering questions or not as they chose because they have a right to silence, but certainly they would have had the allegations put to them. That didn't happen. That was a failure of policing. And that's only exacerbated the situation uh, because we really didn't have at that time a police force that was prepared to stand up and, and do their sworn duty. I believe under the current Chief Commissioner, we may not in the future. In fact, I'm fairly certain we won't have that problem in the future. Yeah. I'm actually horrified at the moment, Cal. I know this is a bit off the subject, but I won't say where, Steve, but my local police station that I always thought was five minutes away, and if anything horrid happened, they were right there. I just found out that they've closed. I can't remember the last time I saw a police officer sort of in his uniform walking around. And I have driven many, 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 many times from here to the city and back on the Monash and have never seen a police car. Cal, where are all the police? Oh, many of them are manning COVID checkpoints that are certainly pointless. And, uh, and that's taking up a large section of the workforce. But there's also, uh, under the current Chief Commissioner, a change of philosophy. And in future, I'm quite sure you'll see police cars on the road. You'll see people, police people in the streets, in shopping centres. They'll be much more visible because a visible police presence is one of the fundamental keystones of adequate policing. I agree. Uh, you know, in the UK, it, it, even if you're walking around a small village, there's a Bobby on the beat. He'll either be on his own or with a mate and they're walking around and it's sort of the ever presence, you know, of the law and it makes everyone feel secure. And I have to say in Australia, I can't remember the last time I saw a police officer. I've said many times at our meeting, if I want to see a police car, I drive past the Orphan Police Station, not far from where I live. <laughs> I'll go hunting for them. I literally have to go hunting for the police. Where are you? It's well, like, where's well, Wally? Where's the cops? <laughs> But I'm sure that's going to change because uh, the current chief commissioner certainly knows what's required to Good. make contact with the public and interact with the public and serve the public needs. He's very conscious of that. And uh, we, I make no apology for saying, I believe for the last 20 years, we've had some less than adequate uh, people as chief commissioner. It's good that you stay on top of it, Cal, because obviously you have the experience Nicola. Well, I'd like to be uh, at 83 years of age, sitting back, doing very little, but um, yeah. I reached the point where I could no longer um, sit idle and, uh, and not speak up. Well, you're and speaking up now. Yes, We're I'm listening, ready. Cal. So, Steve, tell us, what, like, what can we do? How can we make it better? Because obviously we want to do everything legally. We want to do it fairly. We want to do it intelligently. Mm -hmm. Should we keep talking about it? Because it seems like as well particularly with social media and this whole censorship thing that's going on. I know I'm a victim of it myself with some shadow banning and they won't let me post certain things. We're not really allowed to have an opinion anymore against government. How do you feel about that? How, how will we never get, navigate that? It, it's difficult, Nicola. And what can we do? We, we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep making noise about it. Uh, and I think the future of democracy rests on the shoulders of people like you and people like Kel good people who stand up and say, this, this cannot be tolerated. We must change this. If we are to have a government that is accountable to us and answerable to us, then we need uh, a mechanism in our, in our state constitution that we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think the uh, recall petition, the recall election is, is a, good, um, a good way of achieving that. If people like that, if they're interested in it, they can see more about it on the CAA uh, website, which is caainc.org.au 
caainc.org.au caainc.org.au go and learn all about this yep we have a petition there a link to a petition there that we're running on on change.org now we we know that a petition on change.org doesn't change the world but it allows us to gauge the level of support and it helps us to spread the message amongst people that there is a way to make this better yeah. Uh, we've, we've lost our freedoms lately, the freedom to move, the freedom to associate, the freedom to work, the freedom to trade, and the freedom to speak your mind. They have all been constrained or taken away from us at various times at the stroke of a pen. Yeah. Uh, there is no guarantee that they will all be returned. We promise oh. that they will, but mm -hmm. there is no guarantee. We have to trust that the Premier will be true to his word. Now, he's broken a few of those promises in the past, so we can only hope that all of these freedoms will be returned to us, that we will have a free and fair election in, in 2022. But what would happen if there was a new state of emergency declared or if there, this one was continued through to then or a yeah. new state of disaster? It would make it impossible for any opposition to effectively campaign and get out there and, and, and canvass for votes. The it USA, a perfect example, the USA. Yes. Yeah, these, these state of emergency powers can be used to entrench uh, the government of the day, the premier of the day, in a position fear, using fear just as they've done in, in um, despotic countries. Yeah. This is a well-trodden path, and it's one we should be aware of. I'm very aware only... of it. Very, these masks that we're wearing, I, I read a scary quote yesterday, and it said that... Um, that, that, that this was governments laughing at us because the mask can't protect us from COVID-19, but it is a visual message to say, you have lost your freedom of speech. And because, yeah. you know, you used to stand in the queue at the supermarket and you discuss everything that was going on. Even if it was a comment by Sam Newman and it was on the front of the Herald Sun in front of you, you'd start talking about it. They've managed yeah. to find a way that we're not talking to each other. So we are going to social media, we are going to conversations like this and they don't want it to happen. They're removing them they're silencing us it's absolutely terrifying me hmm. yeah uh, it to change that we have to uh, build a movement we have to tell people that there is an answer out there we have to let them know how this works and hopefully uh, persuade them that it, that it's a worthwhile uh, alternative it's a worthwhile uh, a worthwhile circuit breaker uh, in our democratic system, and it will protect our democratic rights. The fact that a recall election simply exists is enough to constrain bad, corrupt, or despotic governments. Bad because it'll always be something, it's, yeah. the, it's the sword of Damocles hanging over their head. It's there to say, if you don't do the right thing, the people have an answer. Yeah, and the people a voice. Yeah, the people should have one. And isn't that what politics is meant to be about? It's meant to be our voice. And the majority of people want the country won, want the state won in a particular way, instead of the handful of people, this political elite making decisions that from what I can hear, most people are not agreeing with. So I'm not gonna let this go too long, Steve, because then it, will, no. it won't load and we need people to hear this. So that, give us the address fine. again, give us the address that people can go to if they're interested. It is caainc.org.au and on there there is a link to the change.org petition if people can get on that and sign that that'll give us an uh, uh, an indicator that this is something uh, worth pursuing we continue to talk with it uh, talk to people about it around the state yeah. we hope people will agree with us and support us on this we we're all we want proper sensible sound responsible government yeah. and uh, I, i'm a believer in democracy i i think churchill said it very effectively when he said, look, democracy is pretty clumsy and, and it's not all that work, worthwhile. Oh, sorry, all that workable, but it's a damn sight better than everything else. Yeah. It's it's physical and accountable, I consider that. Yeah. Uh, it's the best that we've got. It's not perfect, but it's a, it's a lot better than the rest. And this is Australia. And, uh, we need to be a leading light in the world. We can't just stand there and, and follow what everyone else is doing. They say America sneezes and the world catches the cold. Um, we can't be like that. And Australia needs to be this light, I think, of democracy because it's failing in a lot of other countries, I feel, or turning a weird corner. Yeah. So I well, just want to say thank you to Steve MacArthur. Thank you so, so much. I'm really impressed with you guys and I hope it goes well. I'm going to keep following it. Thank you, Cal Glare. Thank you so much. 
And I know everyone will be really excited